Well, this is the favorite passage uh, of those who deny uh, particular redemption, and it's, it's amazing to me. It is another illustration, I think, of uh, what really happens and the lack of, of exegesis that takes place when we deal with this. And that is, you have Hebrews. You have Hebrews chapter 7, 9, and 10, which are specifically on the effect and result of the sacrifice of Christ. So you have sort of like Romans 3, 4, and 5. You have three whole chapters about what justification is. That's where you're going to go to find out what justification is. Then, if you find a single passage that makes reference to the word justified someplace else, you can look at that, and that's important, but that's not the first place you go. The illustration I used a couple mornings ago, or I think it was maybe Friday night, actually, when, or Saturday morning sometime over the course of the past weekend, uh, an individual was talking to me about this, and the example I've used in debates and things like that is that when you, when you buy a new car and you want to know about the light in the car, you go to those passages in the owner's manual, to talk about the lights. Now, you might find about the lights in the electrical system section, and there might be a section in the maintenance section, a section in the warranty section, a section about fuses. But if you want to know about the lights, if there's a whole chapter that says, your lights, that's where you go first. And if you ignore that chapter and just read the little references elsewhere, you might end up messing up because you're not going to the plain sections that teach what the lights are supposed to be about. Well, we see that in our everyday life. We understand that in our everyday life. But when it comes to Scripture, we don't do that. So I've actually debated people on justification who went to a reference in the Gospels where Jesus says, wisdom is justified by her children, build their meaning of the word justified out of that, and then read it into the three chapters of Romans to overthrow everything Paul said. Now, that's an obvious misuse of Scripture. And I would submit that since we have entire passages in Hebrews, Hebrews 7, Hebrews 9, Hebrews 10, as we saw last night, where you have verse after verse specifically on the subject of what Christ accomplished on the cross, that it shows the weakness of a position, that this is the favorite verse that Arminian is going to go to. Second Peter is not about the work of Christ on the cross. Second Peter chapter 2 is about false teachers. It's a section about apostasy in the church and we take what we think is an inference from one passage about false teachers and overthrow everything in three chapters of the book of Hebrews. Exact same thing that Rome does to the issue of justification. But, look at it. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And so, they look at the phrase here, the master who bought them, and say, see, there it is. Christ died. He purchased them with His blood. They are false teachers. They're going to be destroyed. So there can be people that the Master bought who are going to be destroyed. Therefore, the death of Christ in and of itself does not accomplish salvation. It only makes salvation a possibility. They were actually redeemed. They were actually purchased. But they will be destroyed. That is the assertion that is made. Now, if that's the case, and I only have about five minutes here. If that's the case, According to my watch, I have less than that, but we'll go with the clock back there. Is that safe? Okay. If that's the case, then these are the things you have to believe are absolutely certain. A, that the word master refers to Christ. That is, the Greek term here, there it is, despotain or despotes, from which we get our word despot, that that is absolutely in this section has to refer only to Jesus Christ. If there is any possibility that in point of fact it's referring to God the Father, then the entire argument collapses. Alright, that's the first thing. Now you might notice that when we look at this phrase and we ask, well, where else does it appear uh, in the New Testament? There aren't all that many places, but there are places such as Acts 4.24 when the church gathers to pray, and they say, when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O despota, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And then they go on below that to differentiate between the Father and the Son, and it's the Father to whom they're praying. So here is an example of the despotos being the Father, not the Son. 
There are other such uh, passages. It can, it can be used of people who are not God at all, rulers and masters and things like that. Going back here. So the first thing is master has to mean uh, God the Father. It cannot mean... Uh, it, it, I'm sorry, it has to mean Jesus Christ. It cannot mean uh, God the Father. The word bot... Agarazzo. Now, this is the standard term for purchasing, ransoming, and redeeming. However, if you examine its usage in the New Testament, every time it is used salvifically, except for here, if this is the exception, when it refers to the death of Christ, it always has a purchase price mentioned. Redeemed by the blood of Christ. Uh, is normally redeemed with a price. Whatever it might be, in every particular situation where it's used of the death of Christ, the price is mentioned, except here. So, if Master is Christ and Agorazzo is his death, then this is an exception to its usage everywhere else in the New Testament. You can start seeing where some of the problems are here. So, you might say, all right, if this isn't referring to Christ, then what is the passage referring to? What does it mean? Well, I, made a, I gave a reference, and in uh, the few minutes it's difficult to get into all the Old Testament parallels that are presented. But there is a reference in uh, footnote number... Of course, not all of you have this, but if you're interested. Uh, 33 on page 282. Uh, in regards to Gary Long's book, Definite Atonement. Do you have that uh, in the library? Are you familiar with that at all? Okay. There's a, uh, there's a book entitled Definite Atonement. It's a very short book. It's only about 80 some odd pages, maybe 100 pages as I recall. Uh, but Gary Long gave, as far as I can see, one of the most in-depth discussions of the possibilities based upon the Greek text of the interpretationist passage that I could possibly see. Fundamentally, to boil it all down in just a few moments, uh, he points out that agorazo, as it's used in the Greek Septuagint, uh, can have non-redemptive uses, that it can refer and does refer in Septuagint usages, that is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to non-redemptive uh, sovereign acts of God of placing people in positions of authority, and that it is his understanding that this is what Peter is paralleling to, and that hence he uses not Lord, which is the normal word for Jesus in the New Testament. It's normally kurios. Here he uses despotos, and therefore that he's referring here to God sovereignly placing people in positions of authority that they then uh, utilize as false teachers to fill their own bellies, shall we say, uh, and that the reason that they bring swift destruction upon themselves is because of the gravity of the sin that they have committed uh, in betraying a trust that is given to them in the church is, in essence, what it all ends up boiling down to. Uh, but again, it assumes certain things in the text that are not in any way, shape, or form certain, and it amazes me constantly that whenever I encounter a person who says, yeah, but Second Peter 2, 1 says this. In fact, the tape I mentioned before, and I know this is in the library because somebody said that it was. When this, this issue was brought up, when I said, well, have you looked at the meaning of the word despotos that's used there? I don't care what the meaning is. It obviously means this. This is, no, no, wait a minute. And then when we start asking about Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 9. Well, that's not relevant because 2 Peter 2, 1 says this. There was no willingness to uh, engage in exegesis of the entirety of the text and allow it to stand as a whole. So, uh, very, very common for it to be brought up. But unfortunately, it's normally brought up without a whole lot of discussion of its uh, background and of the various uh, interpretations that have been put forward. It's just said, well, see? Uh, and it's funny to me, a lot of folks would, uh, would, would want to say that this passage is saying that the Master can purchase with his blood these men, and yet these men bring swift destruction upon themselves. There's such a desire for man to be able to absolutely overthrow the work of God so that man remains in control. And I just can't help but think of Revelation chapter 5 in contrast to this. Uh, let me show it to you, and that's going to be the, the end of our time, I'm afraid. Revelation 5, here you do have a clear reference to what Christ does by His blood, and notice the contrast. And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Because you were slain, and with your blood 
you purchased for God. You purchased for God with your blood. And there's the same word, agarazzo. So now we have agarazzo with the specific word blood. You purchased for God uh, with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation.